can hold on just a second, I'll do so. Oh, says the host has disabled participation, partic participants for sharing. <laughs> Give it another try, Larry. All right, here we go. There we are. Okay. So I'm going to share this. Now, do you guys see that screen? Do you see the whole screen or just presentation? How about now? You see the, the whole we're, screen? We're seeing everything, Larry. Do you see my pointer? Um, we're seeing the, the PowerPoint. Yeah, here we go. Hold on just a second here. We see the... The first slide, but then we can see the series of five slides on the left. Yeah. For, that's your whole similar. monitor. Yeah. So hold on just a second here. There's a, I forget how to do this part of it. There's a, it becomes an issue. So let me try, uh, hold on just a second. Let me stop sharing for a moment. Let me do something else here. So I'm going to go. And I'm going to come back here. How's that? Do you see the whole thing or still see that's the it. That's the one slide at a time, just the one slide. That's it. Fill in the screen. There's your, yeah, I got you your pointer. It. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> go. I have to use that a lot because. I, I try to point at stuff and explain it, and it makes it a lot easier for me. So, great. Again, thanks for having me. And just basically, we're going to talk about um, innovation and uh, thinking outside the box to mitigate some conflicts on large projects and or uh, we've been working a lot, obviously, George mentioned on bases, over 111 of them in the U.S. Uh, I just put our capability statement together and was um, quite astounded by that uh, by that number. So, um, and so we'll go and just kind of go through this and, and feel free that at the end, if you want to ask as many questions um, as, as you'd like. And I've invited our area manager uh, on this call as well, uh, just in case there's some localized questions that uh, he'll be able to answer. So having said that, um, talk a little bit about uh, Badger and um, the units that we have. This is a triaxle unit, just in case nobody has seen any of these vehicles. Um, it's a, got dual 900 gallon water tanks, about 2,500 gallons or 12 yards of material and debris tank, depending on how much, uh, how much water is introduced into the excavation. And anywhere from 5,500 to 6,200 CFM. We uh, also have variable water pressure up to 2,200 PSI. Above that, you can pretty much be assured you're gonna be doing some damage to facilities. Uh, there are emergency stops on the truck. Our really kind of our motto is if you see something, say something. Everybody around that truck, when that truck is operating, you have the ability to shut it down. Um, and we've got customer, customized nozzles uh, that are made of neoprene rubber. Uh, so there's no damage to any of the facilities on both the dig tube and the wands. Uh, truck consistency, and this is really, really important. Uh, um, everything from our 900 series up to 1700 series trucks are identical. Good example of why that is, is we send drivers all over the country. During, right after Hurricane Michael, we had 110 trucks in the panhandle. We have over 1400 trucks in our, in our fleet of just Badger units. But a guy can fly here from Minnesota, get off the plane and get on this vehicle and it runs exactly the way his does uh, at home. So there's no transition issues there. And the ability to work up to 400 feet away from their vehicle and still get down as much as 80 feet in some locations. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the non-destructive portion of it, we do an awful lot of testing, tolerance testing, and we get material from different vendors and different companies and just test these to make sure there's no damages to them. We document this information and it is there for all of the, uh, all of the operators to have uh, the ability to see all that as well. <clears throat> uh, we also have, uh, we've really just introduced recently line jetting and CCTV work. We're doing a lot of this on the bases 
And we've also partnered up with a pipelining company that works with us. If we go out there, we jet the line, we do the CCTV, we find damage to it. Uh, rather than to replace that line, uh, we bring on our partner and they can actually uh, line, line it in uh, some of the material they're using has got a 75 year lifespan on it. So that's pretty big for us right now. Uh, we also have a flusher truck. Uh, we have a few flusher trucks. Uh, it's a 4,000 gallon truck, about 120 gallons a minute. It's teamed up with a, a hydroback unit. This particular photo, I'm gonna use my little pointer. This photo was on I-4 project. Uh, team these two units up together, we were cleaning about 800 feet of 72 inch pipe a day. Gives you the idea, some, some kind of idea how much, uh, how much we can do in, an, in a day as far as accuracy. We also have high rail units. Uh, we have a few of these around the country. I don't know exactly how many, but these are used uh, in, obviously in the rail systems when you can't get down the right of way and tight right of ways and things of that nature to um, expose utilities, specifically in, in my segment, telecommunications. There's a plethora of telecommunications across the entire nation that run the long line companies that run within rail units. And then these are type of excavations, a deep excavation. Uh, this particular one here, this was a, a casing that was stuck in the ground 100 or uh, 60 some feet. Um, and I take that back, it was 46 feet in the ground and they couldn't get it out. It was a casing for a transmission pole. So we went out there with a line or a, a badger truck and a uh, airlift. And we went down 63 feet to break the earth around the outside of it and the inside of it so they could pull it out. They, they were able to save that. So we can get down extremely deep with no problem. Uh, trenching, we do some pretty accurate trenching, which you're going to see some of that as we move forward as well. And of course, potholing, putting your eyes on it, the non-destructive part of it before it's damaged. Uh, this is just an, an indication of a gas main that was uh, repaired. Uh, it was approximately 59 minutes and seven cubic yards of material. And you could see uh, this photo here, the area that they had to work in. It was very clean vertical walls and things of that nature. This photo here, you can see that's the footprint it needed. If you used yellow iron in that situation, you would have had that whole intersection shut down. So it can be very accurate as far as the, uh, the dig areas. Uh, this is uh, an indication of some of the deep excavation. This was in Orlando off of a four weight bridge. The bridge pier uh, had to be cleared out after the coffer dam was set so they could get the bridge uh, foundations poured. And these dig tubes are approximately seven feet in length. They're aluminum and they couple together. And as you can see, if you get four or five, six of those together, they're kind of hard to control. So they used in this case, and in most cases use a crane to help hoist that down and, and control it a bit. We can sit right up on the bridge and work down alongside of the uh, uh, excavation. This particular coffer dam uh, we got it all cleaned out, and I believe this wall on this side gave way. And two weeks later, uh, well, that was two weeks later, we had to go back out and clean it out again. So we had to do this one twice. Uh, this shows some of the remote capabilities. This vehicle can sit in one location. This was an extremely large footer. Uh, you can see here off the elephant tube, there's your, your dig tubes. Then there's the flex hose that went out to some stick pipe here they could move all around this excavation without moving that vehicle at all. So they could basically do this whole job without moving. And these are just some uh, advantages to the non-destructive portion of it. I won't read each one of these to you, but one I will uh, focus on is the bottom one, which is loss of business revenue. Um, and of course the safety one, that's, that's second to none. Um, there was a company here uh, not too long ago that was doing some directional boring and uh, they crossed an AT&T duct run that was encased in concrete. They did find the top of the duct, did not find the bottom or the sides, did a directional bore that came up too soon and hit the bottom two ducts. Uh, those ducts were um, an 1800 pair and a 1500 pair cable and those were paper cables, which are not, not uh, color coded. So each and every pair of that 18 and 1500 had to be toned from the central office 
to the manhole to the field. It was a very tedious process. It was about $146,000 damage just because they did not find the bottom and the side of that conduit. So it's very important to us that, uh, and we are involved in a lot of damage prevention task teams. I'm on one here in central Florida right now. Uh, we have uh, calls every two weeks. This is very important to us. And, and we're usually the uh-oh call when things like this photo happen. So um, we try to get in there up front. So now we'll move into the meat and potatoes of this presentation. Um, this photo here is the uh, submittals, financial and technical proposals for this project. This project is a $2.3 billion project. It's a three, it's a P3 project. Uh, it's being built by Skanska Granite and Lane uh, as a uh, joint venture. It's 21 miles of I-4 right through downtown Orlando, Florida. And it's 15 major interchanges, 145 bridges are either being rebuilt, built, or added to. Um, they're doing variable toll uh, express lanes, um, various things. And one of the cool things about it was uh, the, the, mem the temporary barrier walls on this, there's over 400 miles on this project. It was seven landscape companies that had to produce 30,000 trees and 68,000 shrubs. And excuse me, the uh, conflict matrix, I was involved in putting this together, uh, 5,500 conflicts on this project. It was just massive. The project was um, delivered or divided up in four different locations, uh, area one, two, three, and four. And uh, I take that back, it's one, two, three, and four. And each different area had its own entity that would do uh, a portion of that project. On the right here is some golly gee whiz facts about it. I think the most important one or the most impressive one is the, the bottom one, 6.7 million cubic yards of material. Uh, if you look at that, that could fill dump trucks nose to tail from Miami to Bangor. Very, very large project. Uh, this was a quarter of a mile off that LA right away. This has an arterial road that has a, a ton of utilities on it. This will come into play here in a few moments as you'll see, but this is what was in this corridor right here. We had to put six or eight other utilities in here. So this was all vacked out. And the idea was to put, uh, have every company put conduit in there from one end to the other in a joint trench, which is what happened here. Um, however, at this location, this particular pro, um, uh, sorry, structure right here is actually about right here. And the gas company was gonna have to relocate this gas main in red because it was in conflict with the structure. But when I got this trench open being 300 feet long, I called the gas company and I asked them if they could come out, take a look at this, see if they might be able to move this two inch steel gas main to get it away from it. I had a 300 foot trench open. And I will add at this point, um, we do not physically handle this, these facilities. We work as a liaison with the master contractor or the contractor or the company, whoever's doing the movement or handling the uh, utility. And so the gas company came out and they were able to move this gas main. And the way they did it was they came out and used spud bars and moved it over and then they staked it back with two by fours, staked it here, and then it was backfilled. Again, this structure as then about right here, you can see the gas main moved over here and then came back here. So this process here took about an hour and it was uh, saved, I think it was $68,000 or $65,000 to move this 18 inches and was done in the field at the time, just thinking outside the box. So this is the same intersection that structure you just saw is right here. The, excuse me, all of these utilities are in this corridor and had to be relocated again, a quarter of a mile off the main LA right away. So when I brought this up to put in this presentation, all of these were layered in blue beam uh, for the, all the uh, utilities that were putting their relocation on it. And when it came in, it came in like this. So I left it, it's, this is, was reality. Uh, one layer at a time for all these utilities to relocate in here. Very, very large corridor for utilities. 
the first location that I thought about doing a mass excavation was this location here. Uh, there were nine telecoms here that went into this central office and they were in the road that used, used to go this way. The road was being realigned now and going straight through. So all of these utilities were being taken out. Uh, this photo here is all of their handholds where they had gone into the, uh, the central office. So the idea was to coordinate this. We got all the companies out there and I pulled all the handholds and made sure there was a slack of cable and they were in pipe. If you have those two entities there, you're moving this stuff physically. So after getting everyone out there, we started getting this up. And you can see the, this manhole right here, keep this in mind, it was the only thing that ended up in the new pavement. Everything else was moved back, way back here. And I'll add also there was no splicing and no outages and no damages during this process. Again, it was done very, uh, it had to be coordinated like an orchestra. Uh, you can see the way these, uh, these conduit laying in here, these folks were all intertwined. And if you can imagine nine companies going back through here with a directional board and relocating all this stuff, it would have been an impossible nightmare. Uh, again, th this is what was in one of the handholes. <clears throat> Excuse me, this was another coil and another one. And again, the manhole is the only thing that remained. We ended up with uh, this particular company, which was uh, CenturyLink. They ran right through this root ball of a palm tree. This all had to be cut out as well. This is as they were moving. Um, this, I put this picture on this side in here first, very specific reason. All my years in telecommunications, there's nine companies here that are fighting for the same broadband service. This gentleman here did not have a machine with him that day. He was working for, for Verizon MCI. Uh, the company here that had this backhoe was these guys, were these guys, sorry working for CenturyLink, they actually used their, their backhoe to help this gentleman set his handhold. In this industry, it's, that's unheard of. That's how well orchestrated this was. And I was very proud to, of that part of this thing. So you can see now everybody's starting to line up way back here. Again, there's our manhole that, that stayed where it's at. AT&T, AT&T Florida and AT&T Corp all came out here and said, we want a directional bore, bore through here. They, didn't, they uh, did not know it was in the ground here. Once we had this open, they said, no, nah, this isn't gonna work for us. And I agreed 100%, that was my job. So I asked them if you would bring conduit out, we will put conduit in from one end of this excavation to the other and you could meet it uh, from both sides, which they ended up doing. This is a temporary. Uh, there's the AT&T conduit that was placed in there. Everybody has moved over now. Again, there's our manhole. This is temporary because they had to put a bike path back. You can see the road starting to line up on the other side of the new transmission poles. A new bridge comes through here. Uh, this road goes underneath the bridge. Um, it's, it's a total reconstruction. Again, manhole is still here. This is the before and after. This is what we started with. This is what we ended up with here. There's the manhole ended up in the pavement. Can see the new bridge, everything's lined up. All these handholes lined up in the sidewalk. They were staggered specifically for a reason so the pipe could run between them and that if these head companies had to get back in there. What's really, really cool about this is the length of time was 43 days approximately. Nine companies, no splicing, no outages. Months before the road construction came through would have been approximately $3.7 million to relocate. This was all done with the help of the contractor and the hydroback for about $120,000. Now, again, I'm gonna reiterate, this is a 3P pro or P3 project, federally funded, 100% reimbursable to the utility. So it was, all, it was all reimbursable by the contractor. So we decided we're gonna do this one more time in another location, how successful that was. Large bridge pier here, drill shaft here, Drill shaft, drill shaft, pier, another bridge uh, pier here. This was an eight story building. Six companies went into this building, the same as the other one and went back out. Everything you see here in red, it was in trouble with this main bridge pier. 
everything in gold is where they were moved to. Again, no splicing, no outages. And you'll see how we did that. Again, communication, coordination, cooperation, and commitment. This is what needs to take place on these. Uh, I had all these people here, and these are all representatives of the telecoms and the SGL people. So everybody knew exactly what the, the process was going to be and what we were going after. This gentleman right here owned the two floors on the building, the eight story building that these guys went in and out of. And he had two floors of central office multiplexing equipment. And he said, Larry, I cannot tell you who is in this building, but I can tell you if that something gets damaged, there will be black suburbans and helicopters here. So we knew at that point that we were up against something very, <laughs> very, uh, very tedious and had to be controlled very good. So we got started. This was day one before we got started at all. This was day like three and a half. And again, you can see there was a lot more on the ground here that was anticipated. What happens here is there is four or five layers of bridge here that all comes together. Three bridges come together right here. and The bridge pier ends up at this location. So this is from the roof of the building. That main bridge pier goes right here. It actually goes into the parking lot, takes out everybody in here. So um, this just gives you an idea of some of the excavation that was taking place here. This is also from the roof. This is a 54 inch diameter oak tree right here that was cut down. And this is the root system that was involved. This is one of the dig tubes where they had, won't go to, they had left to go dispose the material out of our truck. So I went back to the roof and took this photo. This right here is Verizon MCI and AT&T Florida. So when you get down to the ground level, that's what we were dealing with. So the idea here was now, what do we do, Larry? And I said, well, if we stop now, then this whole thing is for nothing. So the idea was to have the contractor, the road contractor come out there and strategically cut all these roots out and get the root ball out of there so we can continue to do with what we wanted to on this thing. So they did that. Uh, this gentleman right here is 6'3", gives you some idea of the root that we pulled out of there, the tree stump. I named it the Kraken. It was just a monstrous beast. This is the hole that it left in the ground. So there's the Verizon and, M and uh, AT&T at this point. So they started relocating. The companies came out and did this. Some of them had to be relocated together because of the way they were laying in the trenches. Um, this company right here was uh, level three. This was eight pipe. This is the other two. This is six of them that already had been relocated by pulling slack out of the manhole, which was on the other side of this street. These two hadn't been relocated yet. Um, this was a coil of cable that was in a handhold that was just coiled up here and left. That's going to be moved at a later date. Uh, again, just how everybody was laying in here and all the handholds that were there and had to be uh, taken out so everybody could work in here. And when upper management for this large project came to me and said, well, you're going to do what with what? And when I explained it, one of the things that I, I made it made a point of is that if this could be done, look at the area that these six companies get to go in and relocate their stuff. It's, it, there's no way you could go through here individually with the directional bore or trencher and, and relocate this. This is uh, the Verizon conduit. It used to be straight through here. They cut the conduit off, removed it, and then pulled slack, and then moved it over and put split duck on it for here. This is a drilled shaft. This is uh, level three, and AT&T was here. They had to split this shaft. And then this is looking at it from this direction, looking back, how they, this is exactly what had to happen here. They were moved from here to here. And I think that was about a 32 foot move laterally. That was the largest uh, move that we were able to do. This company had 150 feet of slack in the conduit or in the uh, handles and we were able to make this work. So again, this is from the roof. Um, the drilled shaft over here, you can see this is a Verizon MC MCI. This was level three that was all moved over here. If you remember, they ran right through here. This is where the large uh, bridge pier is going. Everybody has been moved out of the way now. 
when this was done, we went out with the uh, surveyor and every 20 feet, we shot the location. We gave it, we gave it a northing easting. Uh, we said who it was, what it was. And I gave this back to the, uh, the utilities and uh, DGN, a KMZ and also a PDF. So there was no question about where their facilities were moved to. And going to the west of here, which is this direction here, were two more companies that you'll see here. Um, this trench was opened up. They had to be moved from here to this side over here. And you can see this right here where uh, Verizon used to lay. You can see the indentation of the conduit. The way we did that, used a mini hoe, and then we would vac underneath it, get a hole, strap the conduit, pull it up, backfill underneath it, and just lay it on the ground. And then they would move it over from this side to this side and stake it back. You'll see in this next frame how that works. Basically, they just ring cut this conduit, pulled the slack out of the handholes, moved the conduit over, staked it back, and then put split duct from here to here to uh, make up the difference so they still had the continuity in their, in their conduit. This particular project, this is the end of that. And where that machine is, is about where the drill shaft was going or the uh, last bridge pier. So we had moved them over to this location from here. Again, approximately 90 days to do in the field, six companies, no outages, a year before the bridge construction, which ended up being probably closer to two years by the time everything was done, would have been approximately $3.1 million was done again, around $150,000. So I will point out that if the contractor's not footing the bill for this, it's a very attractive cost versus the 3.1 million uh, as well. And the way that happens, if you had nine companies or six companies in this particular case, all of these companies would share the cost of moving these things. It's a, it's a really concerted effort and it works well if it's coordinated properly. This is gonna be my, my favorite challenge. Um, there was 24 four inch conduit AT&T Florida had here and they were, it was in trouble with dual 54 inch RCP that had zero flexibility. They tried using an elliptical pipe, everything. Uh, they had to be lowered. So they said, what, would, what are we gonna do? And I said, well, we'll go out there and we're gonna lower it. And so the way that happened is uh, the contract, we dug test holes on everything. The contractor took the overburden off to this point because we knew where the conduit was. Then it was banded every, I think it was every 20 feet. Then we used a track hole to hold it up. And then we would back down underneath it. You could see where we had to go from here to here in order to get the clearance we needed. And we had quite a bit of the uh, exposed in order to get that slack. But again, the way that happens is we back underneath it and it naturally splays out. You can kind of see that process here. We lowered it all the way and it was the belly of it was right here, about where this gentleman's standing is where the two pipe cross. This is a manhole. So now the question was, Larry, what are you gonna do now? We don't have enough clearance. We can't lower it anymore because we're up against the manhole. So my thought was, well, we could physically lower the manhole. Had I done that yet? Yeah, no. Was I, um, was I entertaining it? Absolutely. Um, thinking completely outside the box, this particular project, I got rid of the box altogether. Uh, so I got thinking about this and back in the day when AT&T would jack and bore a steel casing across a major road like the I-4 project or that road, they would uh, stuff the steel casing with as many pipe as would go in, in this case, 24 four inch conduit. So what I looked at was going out of this J manhole right here, went this direction, fed all of Universal Studios in Orlando. But I realized that when I got in the manhole, there was only 16 pipe to the field. So I went to AT&T and I said, if I were to go back and cut off go 40 feet from the manhole wall, cut off the top six pipe, which were empty and seal them. You're never gonna use more than 16 of this 24 pipe ever to the field in the future. They looked at it, they agreed with me and we were able to do that. So 
what was what was important about this and what makes it my favorite again right behind oops, sorry right behind this motel the hyatt place is universal studios i will also add this was a 20 million dollar bonus work element for the contractor at&t would have taken about 18 months to relocate this and about a million and a half dollars this was done for less in less than two days for less than fifteen thousand dollars the contractor again took the overburden off of it, but once the vac, all the vac work was done and the outside the box process came up, this is what we ended up with. The bonus work element was met, everything went just beautifully. Um, and again, just outside the box, coming up with something in the field based on what you're, what you're faced with. This particular project here, I was brought onto this one to mitigate conflicts. There were several conflicts they had 117 transmission poles they had to place in three months, and they had conflicts. One of them was uh, broad, Summit Broadband, and it was uh, 288 and a 96 fiber that ran right through here through the excavation of this pole. And so we put, pulled slack out of the manholes, ring cut the pipe, stood the pipe up, tied it off, staked back the conduit. Then they brought the can in from the opposite side, set it in. We sunk the can down. Once the can was in the ground, they went, pulled the slack out, and then put three foot of, of split duck on the conduit to maintain the continuity between here around the side of the can. It worked beautifully. That took, uh, I think it was around three hours. On that same day, right around the corner from that, that pole was right over here. This one uh, was in conflict here. You can see the excavation for the casing. This went right through here. So this was charter communications. We vac back 20 feet to the handhole and behind us. And then they came out and pulled the conduit up and actually tied it off to our truck. They went in from the other side again, put the can in, sunk it down, did that in I think an hour, hour and a half. So again, both of these were mitigated in the same afternoon. And these corner 45 inch, 110 foot concrete poles were placed that evening because they were able to get the cans in the ground. This is that same project, the very last pole, right, this location right here. The original Sioux work showed an unidentified utility in here. Well, what I realized was AT&T, or I'm sorry, CenturyLink came up from the south and they, this is their last pedestal. They ran through here with a 25 pair cable and two drops. So I called my contacts with CenturyLink, asked them if they could come out if I would trench back to this location, would they cut the, the new pedestal in here and just get rid of this in here? They did. You can see here, they're out here cutting this in right now. And this right here is going to be important in just a moment. So we looked into this location and this was what was in here. Uh, this is distribution three phase buried power running right through the middle of this. So the question was now what? And I don't typically work with power um, or, or gas in any sense because I'm scared of both of those. But my suggestion was to, you have two options. You could either get it replaced, but that would take months, or you could get an outage and do it in a couple of hours. And so again, if you, if you look back to this location, the reason this is important is that is the power doghouse. That's where it, these three cables went to. They're not but 20 feet away. So why it was deemed as an unknown utility, I'm not sure this would have been very important information up front. So they were able to get the outage. I suggested putting the cable in ends, getting everything ready on both sides. Once the cut was done, then they came in and cut both sides of it and then put this between it, staked it back, and this pole was able to go in. That was the very last project, or very last pole on this project and they were able to, to make their uh, schedule. So it was very important to come out here and, and, and help them with these things to get things completely out of the way for them. Um, this one, someone brought to my attention. This was back on the I-4 project. This was a uh, the pond at Ivanhoe exits. Uh, there were dual AT&T duck runs right through here that were actually in the pond. Um, they said, now what? And I said, well, we can uh, get all the information on this and see how deep it is and where, where it ends up. 
Turns out it was completely outside of the, of the ground uh, when it ran through the pond, when they got the pond cut. So what I did was, and this would have been approximately $1.5 million to relocate in a two year impact on the schedule, which was, that's what we want to take out of the equation. So I drew this up and I said, if we were to come out here, use this as the proposed ground line, do not do the, this proposed ground line, that leaves these conduit runs out of the ground. We could put a retaining wall in here, extend the, the pipe out, put a mitered end section in the pond, and that would eliminate anybody having to do anything. Uh, they ended up going back. Uh, it was a design build project. So they were able to look at this, get the, the volume they needed out of the pond. And it turns out that they did put uh, the Duke distribution switch gear up behind here on behind this wall as well. Again, just thinking outside the box, coming up with a, a, an answer. My wife calls this a cartoon drawing because it was what I could, the only way I could come up with this to explain what was what was on my mind and if we could do this. They did do it. It saved that uh, million and a half dollars on that one. And this is the last thing in the presentation, but certainly one of my favorites as well. I did a presentation for Dewberry Engineering in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, in the Panhandle. Uh, a representative from Walton County was there, and we took a truck to this presentation to also do a demo at their, their yard uh, for Dewberry. I explained that we love to do demos because we can talk about this all day, but when you see these vehicles in action and, and the Walton County guy stood up and said, I've got, I'd, I'd like got something for you. And I said, as long as you make it a challenge for me, he said, oh, it's a challenge. So there's a road that runs along um, the Gulf of Mexico. It's called 30A, right through, right through Panama City Beach. It's a very affluent area. Tons of bike, bicyclists, bike trails, bike paths. This particular location is always wet. It will not drain. They have six feet of right of way. There was no place to even put la uh, lateral drainage or linear drain, any type of drainage in. So I had learned something on a project years ago and I, I said, I would do this. I would use a 48 inch diameter, 10 foot long pipe, wrap it in material, an ADS pipe, and then we could sink it vertically in the ground and then you fill it with stone and put a steel grate on it and that would work as a basically a vertical French drain. So they said, let's give it a try. And they had no other options. So the day we got out there, we had to remove 2,500 gallons of standing water off the location and the, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, bike path, which you'll see in a moment. Incidentally, we can remove 2,500 gallons of water and in about 40 seconds. It's very, very quick. Um, this project would have cost them around $1,500. It was a demo. We did not cost them, but I charged them. But I put this in there to indicate the little effect uh, or the little amount that, that the large effect got. So once we remove the water, and you can see here, this gentleman is standing on the bike path that looks like this most of the time. This is where the pipe is going to go. Here's the pipe. They brought it out. And I will point out again, this is the county's uh, personnel. They provided the MOT. They provided the pipe and things of that nature. So um, the first thing we did was went in and, and located the power back here and the telephone here. We had clearance to put this 48-inch diameter pipe in. We dug down five feet. And we put that in the ground. They used their machine to push it down. We would vac out on the inside. They push it down if this goes a little bit at a time. It went very quickly. I was surprised there was no water in this excavation at all. Now I'm 200 yards from the Gulf of Mexico. So they got this down farther. And this was, took a little bit longer than normal because of the fact that this pipe, the more of it that you get in the ground, being that it is perforate or uh, it ribbed, it does have an accordion effect, but we were able to get it down to grade. And once that was done, these are the before and after. Here's your, your rock they put on top of the drainage. This is the bike path that was always full of water. Uh, it went from this to this. And again, it was being able to have this challenge. Uh, I That's what I thrive on is, is the challenge of, of making something like this work. A lot of times, again, out of the box, 
We are going to use this in uh, several several of the locations in Walton County. And um, we have also been commissioned just recently to do all of their line jetting and CCTV work and also uh, mapping of all their drainage uh, throughout the entire county. Uh, so, so they know that we're a problem solver and, and we, we love to do this. So uh, and that is the last uh, slide of the presentation. And I will stop sharing here. Um, Let's see, I do want to see if, yes, um, Ron Heath is on. Ron is the area manager for Badger, and Ron is located about 20 miles north of you guys. And I just wanted to, to uh, uh, kind of introduce him. And if there's any questions on a local level, uh, I get the question all the time, can you dig in our, our soil? Uh, I'm in Florida. We have sand. Yeah, it's real easy. So if there's questions specifically for a, a uh, area geographically, I always like to have uh, the area manager answer those questions if there are any. So I do see Ron's on there. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or Ron. And Ron will be looking into also joining this post uh, and, and being involved with you guys. He just sent me this morning uh, several other uh, bases that we've worked on in the Virginia, Virginia Beach area, so. And then just, uh, this is Ron Heath. I'm just going to jump in here real quick. My, uh, my internet connection on my hotspot's been popping in and out, so I lost a little bit on the front end of this, but uh, even if your questions come later, uh, project specific, we can look at it. And to Larry's point in Virginia, as everybody knows, coast to the mountain, we run from anywhere from sand, clay, and uh, bedrock. So we see a little bit of everything in Virginia. We, we get through what we can get through. We have our challenges at times. Uh, obviously, we can't dig through rock, but we can get you down to the surface of the rock. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like Larry. I like the ones with a little bit of a challenge. And uh, we're in one right now trying to pull some sandy material about 660 feet away down in a wetland area where it blew out. So uh, there's a wide range of services we can provide with these units. And uh, to Larry's point, hit it dead on. We can talk about what these units can do all day long with our operators. But when you get them out on the job site and you put them, put them into action, they speak volumes. That was, uh, that was great, Larry. Uh, there is a question somebody's got here. It's more of a curiosity on how do you deal with, you know, things that happen on sites. Where does the slack come from to move the utility cables around? interferences without splices or outages? Um, slack of cable uh, in a handhole, and we're talking specifically fiber cable, uh, because nowadays, as we all know, when you get in the right of way of any project, you've got a, a gas main, a water main, maybe some buried power and eight telecommunications companies, whether they be telecom or cable TV or some kind of communication, it may even be county or state facilities that are in there. So. The idea is, is to use the slack. The slack is put in a handhold for either a future splice or there's a splice there. And what that, is, that, splice, that slack is used for is to bring that splice case up out of the handhold and into a splicing trailer. So these are designed where you have to, you wanna get the, the trailer as close as you can to the handhold. So typically you don't need a hundred feet. If, if you're, 100 feet, if you're more than 100 feet from the, the splicing trailer with a splice, that's jo that job has been designed very wrong. So we can use that slack in order to move that stuff around. It's pulled out of the handhold, it's figure eighted, it's pulled into wherever you need to move it to, and then you put it back in. So if you've got slack and it's in pipe, those are two things that are letting you know you're moving it. Again, as much as 32 feet laterally on that one that one specific project. So copper cable, if you come across copper cable, you can splice slack into a copper cable. That's not a problem. Uh, we've done that, we've, we've exposed it for that as well. The only issue you have with fiber is if you introduce a splice on fiber, you may you automatically introduce uh, DB loss. So it's gotta be calculated by the company to make sure that if there's a splice that's gonna be introduced, that it doesn't, you know, doesn't hurt that because we've done that as, as well. Yeah, I wonder if uh, if a splice was bad, if they could go down the line and find a, another splice they did, and well, no, that'd still be two. 
that wouldn't help. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's a good thing for those handholds and that slack in there because yeah. I don't know what you'd do if you didn't have that. Yeah, and, and, and again, my job is um, telecommunications and conflict mitigation. And we're doing a lot, as I said, around, around the country on these bases. And uh, we just spent uh, several months on um, Eglin Air Force Base. They had to redo 4.8 miles of uh, a jet fuel line. And we had to locate all the utilities and make sure what was there. And my saying at every one of these, these that I do is it is non-destructive. And I wouldn't want to be the guy that takes the fiber cable out feeding the tower on, a, on an Air Force base. So it's uh, very important uh, of what we do. And we have been on bases. We went on the base at Eglin to do one job. And uh, three other companies hired us while we were on there because uh, they saw what we could do. They saw the capabilities of what we could do. So it works very well. And again, it's just the technology of this. Uh, and, and that's what I'm bringing to the table is the technology, the innovation, a, innovation and thinking outside the box because there are conflicts out there. So, and if there's yeah. questions, and again, I can provide my email uh, and also Heath's email if there's any questions for us at a later date. We'd be more than happy to, to answer them for you guys. So, all right, appreciate that. We we did record for recording now, and uh, we'll be putting this this on our website. And the PowerPoint will also be available on our website to anyone else who's watching. Yeah, and again, anybody just feel free to reach out. Even if it's just a, a question you think of after this is over, you're more than welcome to reach out to me, and, and I'll be able to answer it. But if not, I'll get you the person who can answer it. I, I assure you that. All right, Larry. Well, I'm looking and I don't see any more typed questions. Uh, we do have, take this off. Well, they were there for a minute. Well, we had them up there for a minute. There they are. Yep, we're still working on a golf tournament after many postponements, but that will happen. The only question is when, and then we're thinking maybe a little sooner rather than later, but I don't want to divulge too much until we get it confirmed. Um, and registration is coming up in June for the Joint Post Mid-Atlantic Small Business Conference. Oh, and we do have an interesting little thing in May, May 12th, uh, with the Albuquerque Post, um, why you need a personal brand and how to develop it in a virtual world. So that's probably something a lot of us can learn from. Um, so that'll be more information will be coming, about, coming out later about that. Um, next week is April 22nd, topic pending. And I believe that catches us up with everything we want to talk about. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Cabrera Services, Lead Corps Services. And remind everyone that I am your director and I would love to help you become a member if you're not yet. So I'll be reaching out to you, Larry, make sure that we uh, get you guys connected and um, to join our post. And uh, yeah, uh, if you you know want to reach out to me, I'm going to type my um, information in the chat, my email address. Um, but you can also find me on the post uh, website. So I am always available. I am also your regional vice president for the Middle Atlantic region. So if you have any questions about any other posts in the region or getting involved uh, both locally and nationally, please reach out to me. I am a resource for all of you and, um, and I love being able to help. So Lee's uh, email address is in the chat. Just click down center, you just get routed where they need to go if you send it there. All right. Well, Larry, thanks again. Um, it's always nice to have somebody with some more stories to tell. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for having me. I always, I always enjoy doing this presentation and sharing what we've done, so. All right, well, thanks everyone else for watching and we'll see you next month.